All right. As he mentioned last night, the Bible is a sole authority of faith and practice. And um, in this class, we have a decent amount of material. To this point, we've been in the scriptures for the most part. But there's a decent amount of material that we're going to get into pretty soon that's historical and, uh, you know, basically it's extra biblical. And that doesn't mean necessarily that it's bad. That doesn't mean that it's not true. But the question you have to come back to always is, does, does the extra biblical history fit with the Bible? Does it fit with the Bible? Does it match up with the Bible? And if it does... Then, then if we have lots of sources coming in, extra-biblical sources coming into us, there's nothing wrong with accepting those extra-biblical sources as long as they don't contradict the Bible. Can you understand what I'm saying? It's very important that you understand, you know, as you look at extra-biblical history from the Greeks and from the Persians and from the Romans, there's nothing wrong with accepting that history as long as it matches up with the Bible. So, uh, you know, as long as, you know, when, I, when we say that, does it lead into the New Testament? Does it fulfill prophecy from the Old Testament? Okay, if it does, then you accept it. It's good history. doesn't mean that it's perfect. Uh, uh, the Babylonian history that we looked at, uh, the video that you looked at, I know some of that, I know, understand that some of that is uh, not true. It's not from the Bible, Okay, I understand that. But at the same time, there's a lot of historical things that we can see there that are true and that can give us a better appreciation for what Daniel faced in Babylon, a better appreciation for what uh, uh, the, the exiles went through. Okay? That's why I showed you the video, because it, it gives you a, a bigger picture of uh, what life was like in Babylon. And it was rough. Uh, being a Christian, being a believer in Babylon. Not a Christian, a believer. Okay? <clears throat> so, I'm going to go to uh, the section that I call Haggai's um, Exhortations. Haggai's Exhortations. I think you have that under uh, capital letter G. Let me just check that real quick for you here as well. I want to make sure we're on the, literally on the same page. Uh, nope, you don't. I, I moved some things around. You have that uh, on page number six, the bottom of page number six. You have the return to Palestine, Zerubbabel's return, Ezra's four different attempts. Ezra records four different attempts originally in the Council of Satan to stop the work. Immediately after that, you have Haggai's exhortations. Everybody find that? Page, bottom of page number six. Okay, he uh, challenged the people. Oh, by the way, let me go back a little bit. Um, we've discussed a little bit of uh, the devil's attempts to stop the work that was going on. We mentioned the Samaritan enemies tried to join the workforce um, and undermine the efforts. Those Samaritan enemies are, uh, are foreigners, and uh, we're still going to have a look at the Samaritans when we get uh, a little bit later on in this history. But uh, when this attempt failed, these enemies mounted a campaign of discouragement, tried to stop them through discouragement. Then they wrote letters um, to the, back to Persia to try to get the work stopped. And then finally force was used when they got those letters back from Persia saying that the work had to stop. And for 16 years... They uh, stopped building on the temple. They had laid the foundation. They probably had, had built up some of the, the walls, but they hadn't completed the temple. And so finally, Haggai and Zechariah encouraged the people to get back to work. He delivered these exhortations between August and December of 520 B.C. And he challenged them to put the building of the temple above their own home building. Haggai chapter 1, uh, he says that you've built yourselves houses and you planted vineyards and you've uh, established gardens for yourselves and you've done all these things in your own homes and the temple of God still isn't finished. So get back to work. And he encouraged them to get back to work. Now, 
The next section we're going to look at is the greater glory of the second temple. This second temple, as it was being built, was a very simple structure compared to what Solomon had built and had been torn down by the Babylonians. And so Haggai makes this very interesting point that uh, this second temple, even though it's not as grand and glorious, will have a much greater glory because of several reasons. So turn to the book of Haggai, if you can find it. It's the uh, third to the last book in the Old Testament. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Haggai chapter 2 does have two chapters in the book. And here in chapter 2, <clears throat> Haggai assures them that this very modest temple that they were building would enjoy a greater glory and importance than the splendid temple of Solomon which preceded it. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek. By the way, Zerubbabel is the governor, who is Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. So there's always this two-figure head. And to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory, and how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? So the second temple in comparison is nothing. If you saw the first temple, if you're ancient of days, and you saw the first temple as a little kid, you will say that this temple is nothing. Verse 4, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, by the way, when, when uh, liberal scholars read this, and even sometimes our book, our textbook, it'll say something to the effect that the Jews were trying to get the people motivated to work because the people didn't want to work, and so they used these arguments. These are more than arguments. These are fact. Yeah, I hate it when, when people downplay the, 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 the messages of the prophets and say that these are just arguments that they're using or Ezra was using this to, to encourage the people. The, these are facts. Okay? These are not just an argument that like a politician would make. That's really what they're boiling this down to. This is just a politician trying to play the part, you know, manipulate the people. This is a fact. Uh, the, the, uh, they were trying to get the people to work, but why? Because it actually would have a greater glory. Verse 5. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver and gold of the temple uh, is mine. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Hope you understand that prophecy is all mixed together. This is not in chronological order. When the heavens and the earth are shaken, that probably hasn't happened yet. Okay, I hope not, you know. Um, anyway, we're living in a twilight zone if it did. Um, but the heavens, anyway, that, that has yet to take place. But the glory of the temple has already taken place. That second temple housed, in a sense, Jesus Christ himself entering into that temple. Okay, the glory of that temple, the, the gospels record several times where Jesus went into the temple. What's the first one that you can think of? Eight days old, actually. He went into the temple at eight days old. The second was when he was 12. And he probably went a few other times in there, but the, the Bible records those two at least. Any more? The priest showed up on the way of God and was like, this is the Christ, whatever, and he was just eight days old or whatever. Okay. Simon, Simon the, uh, and Anna. So 
uh, eight days old, 12, and then, of course, as an adult, he entered in several times and cleansed the temple. But Jesus himself, God himself, entered into this second temple. Okay? Uh, this second temple has been destroyed. I don't believe that this is still a future event of this second temple and its glory. The temple is gone. There's a dome of the rock there. Okay? So... Uh, I believe this is in reference in verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. Why? Because God himself, in the form of the person of Jesus Christ, would enter into this second temple. Okay, any questions or comments on that? All right, next uh, point there. Malachi, <clears throat> the prophet, contemporary of Haggai, predicted that the Messiah of Israel would come into this very temple, Malachi 3.11. The temple was completed in 5.15. God was pleased with the newly built second temple in spite of its modest size and beauty. He took up his abode, and a number of those things were placed back into the temple of the pieces of furniture. Uh, not all of it was there, but most of it was there. Okay? All right, I wanted to touch on that again. I know we, we uh, dwelt on some of that already. Um, let's move on to our next main point there. No kings in Israel. No kings in Israel. <clears throat> There's a period of time where the Bible predicted, where God uh, and the prophets, through the prophets, predicted that there would be uh, no kings in Israel. And of course, that has taken place for many years now. Uh, Luke chapter 21 references the times of the Gentiles and that Jerusalem had been trodden down by the Gentiles. Um, after the Babylonians came along and destroyed Jerusalem, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, the Turks, the French, the British, <laughs> uh, there'd be a long, long time where Israel would go without their own king, even during the time that uh, the Romans ruled over them. Uh, you know, def well, not even before the Romans, the, the Hasmonean dynasty, they weren't of the line of David. This is not a legitimate kingly line. Uh, Herod definitely was not. Uh, he was a king of the Jews. And, of course, that sign that Jesus had over his head, calling him the king of the Jews, was a mockery. Here's the king being crucified as a common criminal. Um, so Israel has no central authority figure, and I believe, personally, that uh, I, I forget exactly. Anyway, I believe that uh, this uh, current administration that Israel has now is probably not, uh, you know, Jesus is probably not going to come into this line of government. He's going to set up his own government. Um, so, me and Josh have had some discussions on this and a few others of you. Um, but I, I personally don't believe, I, be, I believe in Israel. I believe in the, the historical and spiritual significance of the nation of Israel. But once you understand something, and this is uh, uh, something I came to realize when I went to Israel. I always, I always heard of, if you're a citizen of Israel, that means you're a Jew, and that's not the case at all, okay? Uh, if you're a citizen of Israel, you, most citizens of Israel are of no religious, real religious affiliation. Many of them are Muslim. Many of them are, uh, are Christian, Orthodox, or Catholic. And then a few of them are Jews. Okay? The smallest of the major groups in Israel are Jews. Okay? So I understand. Um, <clears throat> what's his name? Uh, I mean, you go down through the leaders, the prime ministers of Israel since 1948, and most of them are not uh, uh, traditional Orthodox Jews. Okay, you don't see him looking like an Orthodox Jew with the long sideburns hanging off of him and so on. And the funny clothes. Uh, Amish clothes, right? <laughs> they look kind of 
Uh, like uh, over and over again, I keep thinking, whoa, there's an Amish. Oh, sorry, it's a Jew. <laughs> but um, so anyway, my point is that I don't believe, I believe in Israel to the extent that, that the nation of Israel is a dwelling place, is a safe haven for God's people. Okay? It's the land of the Jews. It's their homeland. It's a safe haven for the Jews. Yes? Um, not to get off this big of a rabbit trail, but I'm, there's just been an overemphasis that's been placed that any day Israel's going to be regathered and Jesus is going to come back. But if you look at the Hasmonean dynasty, I'm sure they thought that as well. I mean, and that was, that was Israel. In my mind, it wouldn't surprise me if the state of Israel is destroyed again. Because look at the Romans that came in after the Hasmoneans. Yeah. What, what really is the state of Israel right The now? Romans destroyed the Hasmonean dynasty. The, Romans, uh, the Jews obviously thought that Jesus would be the next king. That's what we find in the, in, the, in the Gospels. They over and over thought, I mean, they were convinced that Jesus was going to be the king. The disciples were convinced that Jesus was going to be the king. And when Judas finally realized that Jesus was not about to set up his kingdom, that's when he betrayed him. So, and then all of the other disciples, I mean, they thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom. So, to, to continue with that thought, I wouldn't be one bit surprised. Okay. Um, over and over, the Jews have thought that their time had come. And, and over and over again, the, the times of the Gentiles continued. <laughs> uh, Romans uh, chapter 10 and chapter 11 talk a lot about that. I mean, just it, it's not the time yet for Israel's restoration. And I say Israel. Okay, that's also, you got to be careful what you, you know, Israel, I'm not talking the nation of Israel as in all the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews all put together. I'm talking Jews, God's chosen people. So, is Jesus coming again? Absolutely. Is He going to set up His kingdom in Jerusalem? Absolutely. Zechariah 14 talks about that in a lot of other places in the, in the New Testament. So, I, th I think I mentioned what I was going to about that. But Any other comments on that? I think a lot of times, okay, I don't have a problem. I, I understand uh, America standing with Israel to the extent that Israel is a safe haven for the Jews. That is their homeland. I don't have a problem with Christians, in a sense, standing with Israel. But at the same time, I think we have to keep in mind that Jesus is not a citizen of the nation of Israel. And it's not the nation of Israel, all the Muslims. Okay, if you're going to say that God is, has made His promise of protecting the Muslims, you know, in the sense that the nation of Israel, that's not true. Okay? The Palestinians who live there, that's not true. Um, our guide that we take over there, he's actually an American, he has dual citizenship. He's an American citizen and Israeli citizen. Okay? He's not a part of God's chosen people. So just because somebody is a citizen of Israel doesn't mean that the promise in Genesis chapter 12 is extended to them. That if you bless them, you'll be blessed. And you, you understand what I'm saying? So anyway, I think sometimes we get all confused about this whole thing of what Israel really is. Israel is not the Jews. The nation of Israel is not necessarily the Jews. By the way, what is the blessing that the Jews uh, have that they, that they celebrate more than what we can celebrate? What blessing do they have? Yes. That Jesus can come to them. Yes, that's it. That's the main blessing. Now they have, some, they have the land promised to them and so on, but they don't have it right now. <laughs> you know, they don't have that right now. They'll get it someday. Yes. Why do people think that promise in Genesis 12... Where do we get the application that it's for the Jewish people? Because isn't God talking to Abraham? So why do, why do we just make that jump that if you bless the children of Israel? Like I, I'm just trying to figure out where, the, where is that jump coming from that we're making? Because <laughs> to me, it just seems like God's just talking specifically to Abraham. Well, but he, he blessed him. 
I mean, I know it says that uh, he's going to make him a great nation, but he says, I will bless thee. Why doesn't he say, I'll bless thee and thy seed and say, curse thee and thy seed, then I'll curse them? Why, why, I'm just wondering why we're making that jump. Okay. He promised him a nation, but I mean, doesn't uh, what is the passage? Uh, blessing, blessing, and cursing, and so on. It's on Genesis twelve, verse two and three. Yes, I'll make of thee a great nation. I'll bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I mean, it, to me, it just seems like it's centered really on Abraham as an individual because you know he's right with God. Um, there's another passage, uh, chapter 17, God appears to him again, I'll make a covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly, thou shalt be a father of many nations, neither shall thy name change his name, verse 6, I'll make thee exceeding fruitful, and make all nations, I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, I'll establish my covenant between me and thee, um, does it actually... Yeah, anyway, yes, good point. I, mean, I, just, I, I always hear people say that, and I'm just wondering why, you know? Well, it is definitely the verse it's coming from. Yes. The only reason I was doing it is... In, in chapter 17, verse 7, it says, I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and my seed after thee, and the generations. For an everlasting, for an everlasting covenant. But what is that covenant? To be a God of the end Sorry? The, the covenant primarily is the Son of God, the, the seed. The seed. Okay. The reason I'm saying this, the reason I'm saying this, there's a huge debate whether Israel, and this again, I'm using the term very loosely, the nation of Israel, whether Israel is in the promise of God. Are the Jews... The, the, the promise that the Jews would be great and have nations and kings and so on, I, yes, absolutely. They'd have a land, absolutely. They'd have the Son of God, the, the seed coming from them, absolutely. That's a part of their promise. But the problem is you, you've got people who run with this and run, it leads into... Uh, post-millennial tribulation, and, not post-millennial... Uh, post-tribulation return of Christ, and so on. It, it leads to a lot of other views, which you might say, uh, you might figure out, try to figure out how they're connected, but they are. Um, I know people who have written books on all of this, and, and so on, and actually have a personal connection to it. But um, anyway, it, it leads to a lot of other things, and what you got to understand is, I say you have to understand my opinion is that we get too caught up with all of this stuff with the nation of Israel and all. I don't know. To me, the promise of God was that Jesus would come from them and that the word of God was given to them. Romans chapter 9 verse 1 says that. What's their advantage? Chiefly that unto them were committed the oracles of God, the word of God. So they have the son of God, the seed. They have the word of God given to them. But other than that, <laughs> Jews are usually pretty wicked people. Okay, yes? Didn't Jesus address that issue as far as he didn't come just to save the Jews but also the Gentiles? I mean, he pretty much said that earlier. Sure, All absolutely. The Muslims and stuff, I mean, it goes in the same train of thought. Didn't sure, you? absolutely. The Muslims don't really... As the know. Jews rejected Christ and rejected the Word of God, the, the emphasis was switched to the Gentiles. Absolutely. Uh, that's what happened to Peter. He had to come to realize that. Paul, of course, realized that. Absolutely. Yes? One last thing. But One last thing. I was just going to say that. With Jews, okay, people say, oh, they're blessed no matter what because they're Jews. But in my mind, the only way they can really be blessed is if they get saved. They're, they're blessed the same way we are. They're not inherently blessed. I don't believe that. Right, yeah. God, didn't, God did not show that. Uh, historically in the yeah. Old Testament, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When they sinned and when they did wrong, God punished them. Mm -hmm. so. so, one more thing. 
I said um, one more thing. Um, what has happened is people believe that the Jews are inherently blessed because they're the people of God. And, and that's not necessarily true. I don't see that in the Old Testament at all. Um, why are they so rich and wealthy? It's because they work hard. They practice certain principles, and they steal, right? They practice certain <laughs> principles of the Bible if, as a whole that lead to diligence, leads to, to you know, standing before kings. Okay, That's just the way it works. So they practice principles of the Bible that lead to the right things, or lead to certain things. But they're not inherently blessed of God just because of their background. Paul had to demonstrate that to the Jews who he was writing to. He had to say that specifically. Why are you better than anybody else? Remember, that's in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 2, he talks about how wicked the Jews were. Romans chapter 9, what advantage do you have? It's not your blood. It's not your heritage. Because you've turned away from that. Philippians chapter 3 talks about that. So, anyway, we, we have to be careful, I think. In how much we, we just, oh yeah, I think it's right to be biblical and understand this, I believe, from a biblical perspective. Okay, let's move on. They didn't have kings, and they haven't had kings for many, many, many years. Um, all right, let's see, I get back to our passage here. Isaiah chapter 9, I'm not going to look at, through all of these, but uh, the prophets all speak of this event when a king in the line of David will return and take over Israel and, in fact, take over the entire world. Haggai chapter 2 mentions it, uh, several other places. Let's, I want to quickly touch here. Uh, Joseph and Mary, how did the kingly line come down from David to Jesus Christ? How was the kingly line brought down? Do you... Do you have a Haggai's fourth message? I believe you have that in your, uh, the bottom of page seven, but I didn't give you the, all the verses. So let me have you write down some verses in there. Joseph and Mary were both in the family line of King David. The Bible is very, very clear on that. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter one. Matthew chapter one. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you some facts, and I'm going to tell you what the common conservative interpretation is of these passages. Okay? Matthew chapter 1, verse number 11. I'm not going to read the entire passage. Matthew chapter 1 is a listing of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it starts at Abraham. It doesn't go all the way back to Adam. It starts at Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judas, Pharez, um, Ezra, and so on. Go down to verse 11. And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren. Jeconias <clears throat> was a, a, is a different name for a king. Um, sorry, let me just go back. Jehoiakim, right? No. Is Josiah Josiah? Jeconias. No, it's not Josiah. Um, it's Jehoiakim, the second to the last king of Israel, of Judah. So it's Jehoiakim. Jeconias is Jehoiakim. Um... Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, he begat several more. One of those in verse 12 and 13 is Zerubbabel. Okay, that's Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel is from this line and it continues on. Verse 16, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Okay, now we know, according to the virgin birth of Christ, that uh, teaching that Joseph, which the, the Gospels twice say that, Je that Joseph was not the father of Jesus. 
Of course, the virgin birth teaching teaches that he was not the father of Jesus as well. Okay, so the book of Matthew is a listing of the genealogy of Joseph coming from Jeconias, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah who was cursed that none of his descendants would rule. Okay, now go to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, <clears throat> verse number 27, and I'm not going to read the whole passage again. Verse 23 says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed. This is what Luke added. That's in parentheses. As was supposed, the son of Joseph. Now, here's a listing of what he says is the son of the family line of Joseph, but many of these names that are found here are different names. Different names. Okay, now that's very important to understand. When you get to verse 27, the son of Joanna, the son of Risa, which was the son of Zerubbabel, which was the son of Salaldeon, and so on, it goes on and lists them down. Um, Verse 31, which is the son of Malia, son of Mineh, which is the son of Matatha, son of Nathan, which was the son of David. Okay, that's Solomon, the son of David. So it, they both go back to Solomon. They both go back to King David. But it's commonly believed that here in Luke chapter 3, it's not just the family line of Joseph, but that this listing also includes the family line of Mary. Now, you read a Jewish book, a Jewish encyclopedia, a Jewish website, whatever, and they will vehemently deny this. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They believe that the Apostle Paul... Uh, let me give you a passage. Uh, I'll read to you a passage. I believe it's Romans chapter 1, verse 3. Romans 1, 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So Jesus, in the fleshly line, was from the seed of David. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Well, anyway, the Jews say, well, there's no way that they even believe. They say Paul didn't believe in the virgin birth. He believed that Jesus was born of the flesh. Well, I understand, I interpret that differently, but uh, anyway, so the Jews don't believe in the virgin birth, and they say that this idea that this passage is about Mary is totally a Christian and a pagan philosophy, a pagan teaching that uh, Jesus came through the family line of Mary, that this is actually talking about Mary. And they say there's all kinds of contradictions from Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, which I don't believe that. The reason that there's a lot of different names in Luke chapter 3 is because it combines the family lines of both Joseph and Mary back to King David. And they had some of the same connections, some of the same links going back. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Everybody understand what I was saying? Do I need to summarize that again? Matthew chapter 1 is about Joseph's family line only. Luke chapter 3 is about Joseph's son and of Mary, both of them going back to, jo to uh, King David, um, but splitting off at Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim, sorry. Jeconias. Yes, question? Or is that? All right. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. we got to move on. Um, I mentioned, I have a, a main point there. Ezra's return to rebuild the people took place around 458 B.C. He was a contemporary with Socrates, which is pretty, uh, you know, when you think of Socrates, you think of uh, lofty philosophy and so on. Ezra's right up there with him. Uh, he tried to protect the group of people known as Israel, the Jews, Ezra chapter 10. By the way, uh, while I was gone, I read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah repeatedly, over at least two or three times each. And you, you get the feel 
of them uh, writing uh, some of the events that they wrote about, especially Ezra, he wasn't there for those events, but he writes about them, and then he comes there later on in the book, and uh, he sees what's going on back in Jerusalem in the land of Judah, and he deals with problems that are there. Book of Nehemiah, kind of the same way. It's a long period of time that the book of Nehemiah covers. So, uh, Ezra 4.58, by the way, the, that date of 4.58, we find that from the book of Ezra, linking that to the years of the reign of the Persian rulers. He says, in the year of so-and-so, I did this. Well, if you look at the Persian history, it puts us around 458, 457. If you're within five years of that, you're fine, most likely. Then Nehemiah, the same thing. Uh, you, Nehemiah chapter 1 uh, puts him in a Persian setting in Babylon. So you can date that about 444, 445 B.C., Nehemiah and the walls of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah comes back uh, to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, to fortify the city of Jerusalem. Now, you have on your, in your hand out there a map <clears throat> of the city of Jerusalem under Nehemiah. Um, it's good to understand this, I think. The, the city of Jerusalem has been built and rebuilt so many times that to positively identify walls is almost impossible, the exact location. So there's a note here that uh, there's a lot of debate about the expansion of the city in the days of Nehemiah. The exact location of the walls of Jerusalem are in doubt. So if you see models of Jerusalem and the walls, always understand that there's a lot of speculation about where those walls actually were. Certain walls, especially the ones on the western, if you're looking at your picture on the left side, uh, these, these city walls over here. <clears throat> um, he arrived in Jerusalem in 445 or 444 B.C., 70 years after the temple had been completed. Now that 70 is not not uh, uh, significant necessarily. But by moonlight, he began to inspect the walls. I, I have some pictures here somewhere. And what did I do with them? Here we go. <clears throat> I'll pass these around and you can look at this. Um, some of these, th there's a certain section of wall found on this uh, uh, north, I'm sorry, the west side over here, they call it the broad wall. And the Bible mentions that he built it through or he removed some houses to build it. And there's a very interesting section uh, in, in Jerusalem that you can go to and look down where the city level's up here now. You can look down and they've excavated a section of what they believe to be the broad wall and in the middle of that wall, you can see some foundations of a house sticking out of the wall. And so, whether you know, it's very likely, very possible at least, that that is a part of actually, uh, an actual part of Nehemiah's wall, the broad wall. Anyway, let me explain this a little bit, and you can even look on your other map that you have. When Nehemiah came to the city of Jerusalem, the Bible tells us some of the details of what he did in scouting out the walls. You've all, I'm sure, remember the story that when he got there, he, he went out by the water gate and so on. He went around certain part of the walls. So let's, let's look at that and in just a second, then I'll pass these out. <clears throat> Go to chapter Nehemiah chapter 1. Ezra, Nehemiah. There we go. Actually, uh, it would be in uh, chapter 2, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 12. He was at Jerusalem. He was there three days. I rose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, 
but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass, probably because of the rubble. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. So it says he went out by the gate of the valley. That's probably the valley gate. Uh, there's many valleys, so it's not, you know, he went out by a gate and he happened to be in a valley. That's not what it's saying. He went out by the valley gate and he came around this south side and almost certainly where it says the... Uh, uh, verse 13, the dragon well, the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem. The dung gate is here on the south end, the valley of Hinnom, uh, Gehenna, this southern valley here. He mentions the, the dung gate, um, the dung port. Verse 14, then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool. Now that king's pool would almost certainly be where the king's palace had been, where David's palace was. Uh, and that is here on this southern, southeast portion of the, uh, of the old city of David. It's believed, very commonly believed, that this, uh, this actual location is where there's a, a huge rock wall built there now, a uh, stepped stone structure. Um, I didn't bring any pictures with me, but I've seen. You can see it from the from the Mount of Olives, looking down at Jerusalem. You can see this structure. It was uh, the supports for the palace of David, King David, on top of it. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, building the the walls. How would you call it? A support structure, really, is what it is for the palace of David. And that's almost certainly what he's referring to. In the king's pool, there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then I went I up in the night by the brook. So then he goes out to the brook. So he goes out away from the wall a little bit to get a better scope of the entire thing. This is not up on the temple mount. We're not talking the temple mount. We're talking the actual walls of the old city of David and the old city of Jerusalem over here on this left side. By the way, this old city of David is this finger right here, just this little stretch. But it had been expanded out a lot. <clears throat> Turn back and entered by the gate of the valley, the valley gate. Okay? So this is what he's looking at. I'll pass these around, take a little bit of time if you like, and, uh, and, and look at that. It mentions the gate of the, uh, does it mention the gate of the fountain? Yes, the gate of the fountain, the fountain gate on the west side, or the east side there. All right, so you can take a look at that. Let me check something real quick as far as what you have. All right, look at uh, number three. Well, after he uh, scouts out the city walls, he gathers everybody together. Um, verse 17, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Isn't it amazing? I, I just think that so weird that they built this, rebuilt the temple, They've got many, many people living around there, and they haven't seen the need yet to build the walls back. Um, of course, if, you're, if your temple doesn't have a lot of gold and silver, maybe you don't need to protect it very much. Uh, before the, Solomon, the Temple of Solomon had so much gold and silver, they had to protect it <laughs> in the city of David and so on. So anyway, but it's just odd to me that they finally see the need uh, to build back these walls. Verse 18, Then I told them of the good hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's word that he had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So he encourages them to get back to building. A new enthusiasm, number three, to those in Jerusalem also caused intense, hostile reaction from the enemies of God's people. So the enemies of God's people had tried to stop the work of God under Ezra. They also try to stop the work of God under Nehemiah. So these are some of the same people. Uh, the local governor of Samaria, Sanballat, 
Geshem, the leader of the Arabians, the Edomites, and a wealthy Jew named Tobiah. These opponents began by verbally attacking the project. When the walls were halfway complete, they resorted to force. And what did Nehemiah do? He gave each worker a weapon in one hand and, in a sense, a hammer in the other, you know. Uh, time to work and time to fight at the same time. And the walls were built in 52 days. Now, that doesn't mean completely. I'm not, you know, I don't think that that means all the way around the city. But the major sections were restored in 52 days. The city of, of Jerusalem was protected. When the walls were finished, they instructed the people from the scriptures. Nehemiah chapter 9. Let's go there. Nehemiah chapter 9. <clears throat> they, they bring the people back together and they want to make a covenant and sign a statement saying what they were going to do. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse number 6. Well, I'll go back a few verses. <coughs> Verse 3, And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshipped. Then they cried unto the Lord. Here's their prayer, verses 6 through 38. I won't read the whole thing in a couple verses here. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. Thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Thou art the Lord, the God, which didst choose Abram and broughtest him forth. Notice what he's doing. He's going back through Israel's history and reminding them of what God did for them. Goes through the history of Egypt and what God did there in the Exodus and crossing the Red Sea. And then he lists out their sins. Isn't that very important? Confession. Listing out their sins. Verse 36. <clears throat> Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Listen, if the Jews today would pray like this and realize that their sin is the problem, why are we supporting, why are we doing so much for other kings who rule over us? Because of our sins, not because of our bad political policies. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. And then he lists out the names of those who signed their Declaration of Independence. No, it wasn't the Declaration of Independence. That signed their Declaration. Lists them all out, chapter 10. Verse 28. Go down to verse 28. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanim, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse. That, that word curse there is an oath. And into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, to observe, here's what we're going to do. We're going to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and His judgments and His statutes. And, here it is, that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. And, if the people of the land bring wear and evictions on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year in the exaction of every debt. And he goes on, he lists out lots of things that they were vowing to do. <laughs> um... Go to chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. 
In Nehemiah chapter 13, they'd already gone back. Now, it's, a number of years have gone by, but still, they've already gone back on their word. In verse uh, 4, they, it begins to tell the story of uh, how they let Tobiah, one of the enemies of God, actually have a chamber in the house of God. And so they threw him out and his stuff. Um, verse 15, In those days saw I and Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath. Verse 17, Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? This is exactly why we're in the trouble we're in. Sounds familiar? Verse 23, In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and of Ammon and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language. But according to the language of each people, and I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto theirs. He made them make an oath again. Oh, man. Children of Israel. Okay. One last section that I want to touch on here, and that's the bottom of, uh, right before you, the map that's at the end. The effects of the Persian period on Palestine and the Jews. There's three things here. You want to know these. The term Jew originates as an ethnic label for a person whose ancestors lay in the land of Judah. The term Jew originates during the time that the Jews, yes, were in Persia, in Babylon. 2 Kings chapter 16, 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 6 is the first reference to Jews. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, recovered Eliath the Syrian and drove the Jews from Eliath, and the Syrians came to Eliath and dwelt there unto this day. There's a mention of that. Um, in Esther chapter 2, Esther chapter 2, verse 5, the king is uh, looking for a new uh, queen. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. So this name Jew uh, originates as an ethnic label by foreigners about the people of Judah. They're Jews. Um, of course, in Esther chapter 2, it actually seems to indicate that these Jews lived in communities, which of course we know that's true, but I'm saying they recognized that even, the foreigners did, the outsiders also, another effect of the Persian period on Palestine and the Jews, Jewish sectarianism was embodied in such groups as the Samaritans, the Qumran community, the Pharisees. Now, the point is, many of these groups that make up Judaism, okay, many of the groups, the Pharisees, it mentions a couple of them here, the Pharisees, the Qumran community, the Samaritans, there's many other groups, there always have been, and there always will be until Jesus comes back. Um, these groups have their roots in the Persian time period. When people began, to, uh, the Jews, not people, when the Jews began to form their groups against each other, okay? It mentions the Samaritans. Samaritans, I think some of them have some Jewish blood in them. But as a whole, they're foreigners. I'll prove that later. The Qumran community, the zealots, okay? Zealots, they, they would be much later on, but they, have, they all have their roots in this Persian time period. Um, by the time you get to the, uh, the Romans, the, the Jews, their biggest problems really aren't with the Romans. Their biggest problems are with each other. Okay? And they, that all has its roots in the Persian time period. Okay? We're not going to get into too much detail at this point. Third, another huge effect of the Persian period on Palestine and the Jews is the Aramaic language. Uh, Jews began to speak, began to take on the culture, and began to speak the Aramaic language. 
we've touched on this already, but I think it's important to put this in this section, that this would be a lasting effect on Judaism, on the Jews, um, as far as their language. Uh, remember I mentioned to you in the book of Ezra that he caused them to understand, Ezra chapter 8 or chapter 9, he caused them to understand the reading. What does that mean? He, he had to teach them what the Bible said in their language, Aramaic. And there's many references. I said not a huge portion of the Old Testament, but there are references to this Aramaic language. Of course, the book of Daniel. Um, some of that was written in Aramaic and on and on. It would have a very lasting effect on the Jews. Okay, we'll stop there.